chapter nine of crusaders of new france by william bennett monroe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the coureur de bois the centre and soul of the economic system in new france was the traffic in furs even before the colony contained more than a handful of settlers the profit-making possibilities of this trade were recognized it grew rapidly even in the early days and for more than a hundred and fifty years furnished new france with its sinews of war and peace beginning on the st lawrence this trade moved westward along the great lakes until toward the end of the seventeenth century it passed to the headwaters of the mississippi during the two administrations of frontenac the fur traffic grew to large proportions nor did it show much sign of shrinking for a generation thereafter with the ebb tide of french military power however the traders hold on these western lands began to relax and before the final overthrow of new france it had become greatly weakened in establishing commercial relations with the indians the french voyageur on the st lawrence had several marked advantages over his english and dutch neighbors by temperament he was better adapted than they to be a pioneer of trade no race was more supple than his own in conforming its ways to the very demands of place and time when he was among the indians the frenchman tried to act like one of them and he soon developed in all the arts of forest life a skill which rivalled that of the indian himself the fascination of life in the untamed wilderness with its hair-raising experiences its romance its free abandon appealed more strongly to the french temperament than to that of any other european race non licit omnibus adire corinthum and the french colonists of the seventeenth century had the qualities of personal courage and hardihood which enabled him to enjoy this life to the utmost then there was the jesuit missionary he was the first to visit the indians in their own abodes the first to make his home among them the first to master their language and to understand their habits of mind this sympathetic comprehension gave the jesuit a great influence in the councils of the savages while first of all a soldier of the cross the missionary never forgot however that he was also a sentinel doing outpost duty for his own race apostle he was but patriot too besides it was to the spiritual interest of the missionary to keep his flock in contact with the french alone for if they became acquainted with the english they would soon come under the smirch of heresy to prevent the indians from engaging in any commercial dealings with dutch or english heretics meant encouraging them to trade exclusively with the french in this way the jesuit became one of the most zealous of helpers in carrying out the french programme for diverting to montreal the entire fur trade of the western regions he was thus not only a pioneer of the faith but at the same time a pathfinder of commercial empire it is true no doubt that this service to the trading interests of the colony was but ill requited by those whom it benefited most the trader too often repaid the missionary in pretty poor coin by bringing the curse of the liquor traffic to his doors and by giving denial by shameless conduct to all the good father's moral teachings in spite of such inevitable drawbacks the jesuit rendered a great service to the trading interests of new france far greater indeed than he ever claimed or received credit for in the struggle for the control of the fur trade geographical advantages lay with the french they had two excellent routes from montreal directly into the richest beaver lands of the continent one of these by way of the ottawa and mattawa rivers had the drawback of an overland portage but on the other hand the whole route was reasonably safe from interruption by iroquois or english attack the other route by way of the upper st lawrence and the lakes past cataraqui niagara and detroit on the way to 
michilimackinac or to green bay this was an all-water route save for the short detour around the falls at niagara but it had the disadvantage of passing for a long stretch within easy reach of iroquois interference the french soon realized however that this lake route was the main artery of the colony's fur trade and must be kept open at any cost they accordingly entrenched themselves at all the strategic points along the route fort frontenac at cataraqui was built in sixteen seventy four the fortified post at detroit in sixteen eighty six the fort at niagara in sixteen seventy eight and the establishments at the st saint marie and at michilimackinac had been constructed even earlier but these places only marked the main channels through which the trade passed the real sources of the fur supply were in the great regions now covered by the states of ohio wisconsin iowa and minnesota as it became increasingly necessary that the french should gain a firm footing in these territories as well they proceeded to establish their outposts without delay the post at bay de Point, green bay was established before sixteen eighty five then in rapid succession came trading stockades in the very heart of the beaver lands fort st antoine fort st nicholas fort st croix fort perrot fort st louis and several others no one can study the map of this western country as it was in seventeen hundred without realizing what a stranglehold the french had achieved upon all the vital arteries of its trade the english had no such geographical advantages as the french nor did they adequately appreciate the importance of being first upon the ground with the exception of the hudson after sixteen sixty four they controlled no great waterway leading to the interior and the hudson with its tributaries tapped only the territories of the iroquois which were denuded of beaver at an early date these iroquois might have rendered great service to the english at albany by acting as middlemen in gathering the furs from the west they tried hard indeed to assume this role but as they were practically always at enmity with the western tribes they never succeeded in turning this possibility to their full emolument in only one respect were the french at a serious disadvantage they could not compete with the english in the matter of prices the english trader could give the indian for his furs two or three times as much merchandise as the french could offer him to account for this commercial discrepancy there were several reasons the cost of transportation to and from france was high approximately twice that of freighting from london to boston or new york navigation on the st lawrence was dangerous in those days before buoys and beacons came to mark the shoal waters and the risk of capture at sea during the incessant wars with england was considerable the staples most used in the indian trade utensils muskets blankets and strouds a coarse woolen cloth made into shirts could be bought more cheaply in england than in france rum could be obtained from the british west indies more cheaply than brandy from across the ocean moreover there were duties on furs shipped from quebec and on all goods which came into that post and finally a paternal government in new france set the scale of prices in such a way as to ensure the merchants a large profit it is clear then that in fair and open competition for the indian trade the french would not have survived a single season their only hope was to keep the english away from the indians altogether and particularly from the indians of the fur-bearing regions this was no easy task but in general they managed to do it for nearly a century the most active and at the same time the most picturesque figure in the fur trading system of new france was the coureur de bois without him the trade could neither have been begun nor continued successfully usually a man of good birth of some military training and of more or less education he was a rover of the forest by choice and not as an outcast from civilization young men came from france to serve as officers with the colonial garrison to hold minor civil posts to become seigneurial landholders or merely to seek adventure 
very few came out with the fixed intention of engaging in the forest trade but hundreds fell victims to its magnetism after they had arrived in new france the young officer who grew tired of garrison duty the young seigneur who found yeomanry tedious the young habitant who disliked the daily toil of the farm young men of all social ranks in fact succumbed to this lure of the wilderness i cannot tell you wrote one governor how attractive this life is to all our youth it consists in doing nothing caring nothing following every inclination and getting out of the way of all restraint in any case the ranks of the voyageurs included those who had the best and most virile blood in the colony just how many frenchmen young and old were engaged in the lawless and fascinating life of the forest trader when the fur traffic was at its height cannot be stated with exactness but the number must have been large the intendant du chenot in sixteen eighty estimated that more than eight hundred men out of a colonial population numbering less than ten thousand were off in the woods there is not a family of any account he wrote to the king but has sons brothers uncles and nephews among these coureurs de bois this may be an exaggeration but from references contained in the dispatches of various royal officials one may fairly conclude that du chenot's estimate of the number of traders was not far wide of the mark and there is other evidence as to the size of this exodus to the woods nicholas perrault when he left montreal for green bay in sixteen eighty eight took with him one hundred and forty three voyageurs la Hontan found thirty or forty coureurs de bois at every post in the illinois country among the leaders of the coureurs de bois several names stand out prominently francois dauphin de la forêt nicolas perrault henri de tonty the lieutenants of la salle alphonse de tonty antoine de la motte cadillac gray salon de luc and his brother gray salon de la tourette pierre esprit raillissant amelard chouard du grosselier olivier morel de la dorante jean paul le gardeur de Rompontigny, louis de la porte de louvigny louis and juchereau joliet pierre le sur boucher de la perrière jean perret pierre jobin denis massé nicolas daillet bouste de Monte, francois pertieu etienne brulé charles juchereau de saint-denis perry moreau de la toupin jean nicolet these are only the few who connected themselves with some striking event which has transmitted their names to posterity many of them have left their imprint upon the geographical nomenclature of the middle west hundreds of others the rank and file of this picturesque array gained no place upon the written record since they took part in no striking achievement worthy of mention in the dispatches and memoirs of their day the coureur de bois was rarely a chronicler if the jesuits did not deign to pillory him in their relations or if the royal officials did not single him out for praise in the memorials which they sent home to france each year the coureur de bois might spend his whole active life in the forest without transmitting his name or fame to a future generation and that is what most of them did a few of the voyageurs found that one trip to the wilds was enough and never took to the trade permanently but the great majority once the virus of the free life had entered their veins could not forsake the wild woods to the end of their days the dangers of the life were great and the mortality among the traders was high coureurs de risque they ought to have been called as la hontan remarks but taken as a whole they were a vigorous adventurous strong-limbed set of men it was a genuine compliment that they paid to the wilderness when they chose to spend year after year in its embrace in their methods of trading the coureurs de bois were unlike anything that the world had ever known before the hanseatic merchants of earlier fur trading days in northern europe had established their forts or factories at novgorod at bergen and elsewhere great entrepots stored with merchandise for the neighboring territories the traders lived within and the natives came to the post to barter their furs or other raw materials the merchants of the east india company had established their post in the orient and traded with the natives on the same basis but the norman voyageurs of the new world did things quite differently 
they established fortified posts throughout the regions west of the lakes it is true but they did not make them storehouses nor did they bring to them any considerable stock of merchandise the posts were for use as the headquarters of the coureurs de bois and usually sheltered a small garrison of soldiers during the winter months they likewise served as places of defence in the event of attack and of rendezvous when a trading expedition to montreal was being organized it was not the policy of the french authorities nor was it the plan of the coureurs de bois that any considerable amount of trading should take place at these western stockades they were only the outposts intended to keep the trade running in its proper channels in a word it was the aim of the french to bring the trade to the colony not to send the colony overland to the savages that is the way father carhai phrased it and he was quite right every spring accordingly if the great trade routes to montreal were reasonably free from the danger of an overwhelming iroquois attack the coureurs de bois rounded up the western indians with their stocks of furs from the winter's hunt then proceeding to the grand rendezvous at michilimackinac or green bay the canoes were joined into one great flotilla and the whole array set off down the lakes or by way of the ottawa to montreal this annual fur flotilla often numbered hundreds of canoes the coureurs de bois acting as pilots assisting the indians to ward off attacks and adding their european intelligence to the red man's native cunning about midsummer having covered the thousand miles of water the canoes drew within hail of the settlement of montreal above the lachine rapids the population came forth to meet it with a noisy welcome enterprising cabaretiers in defiance of the royal decrees had usually set up their booths along the shores for the sale of brandy and there was some brisk trading as well as a considerable display of aboriginal boisterousness even before the canoes reached montreal once at the settlement the indians set up their tepees boiled their kettles and unpacked their bundles of peltry a day was get then given over to a great council which the governor of the colony in scarlet cloak and plumed hat often came from quebec to attend there were the usual pledges of friendship the peace pipe went its round and the song of the calumet was sung then the trading really began the merchants of montreal had their little shops along the shore where they spread out for display the merchandise brought by the spring ships from france there were muskets powder and lead blankets in all colours coarse cloth knives hatchets kettles awls needles and other staples of the trade but the indian had a weakness for trinkets of every sort so that cheap and gaudy necklaces bracelets tin looking-glasses little bells combs vermilion and a hundred other things of the sort were there to tempt him and last but not least in its purchasing power was brandy many hogsheads of it were disposed of at every annual fair and while it lasted the indians turned bedlam loose in the town the fair was montreal's gala event in every year for its success meant everything to local prosperity indeed in the few years when owing to the iroquois dangers the flotilla failed to arrive the whole settlement was on the verge of bankruptcy what the indian got for his furs at montreal varied from time to time depending for the most part upon the state of the fur market in france and this again hinged to some extent upon the course of fashions there on one occasion the fashion of wearing low-crowned hats cut the value of beaver skins in two beaver was the fur of furs the mainstay of the trade whether for warmth durability or attractiveness in appearance there was none other to equal it not all beaver skins were valued alike however those taken from animals killed during the winter were preferred to those taken at other seasons while new skins did not bring as high a price as those which the indians had worn for a time and had thus made soft the trade in fact developed a classification of beaver skins into soft and half soft green and half green wet and dry and so on skins of good quality brought at montreal for two to four livres per pound and they averaged a little more than two pounds each the normal cargo of a large canoe was forty packs of skins each pack weighing about fifty pounds translated into the currency of to-day a beaver pelt of fair quality was worth about a dollar when we read in the official dispatches that a half million 
livres worth of skins changed owners at the montreal fair this statement means that at least a hundred thousand animals must have been slaughtered to furnish a large flotilla with its cargo the furs of other animals otter marten and mink were also in demand but brought smaller prices moose hides sold well and so did bear skins some buffalo hides were brought to montreal but in proportion to their value they were bulky and took up so much room in the canoes that the indians did not care to bring them the heyday of the buffalo trade came later with the development of overland transportation at any rate the dependence of new france upon these furs was complete i would have you know asserts one chronicler that canada subsists only upon the trade of these skins and furs three-fourths of which come from the people who live around the great lakes the prosperity of the french colony hinged wholly upon two things whether the routes from the west were open and whether the market for furs in france was holding up upon the former depended the quantity of furs brought to montreal upon the latter the amount of profit which the coureurs de bois and the merchants of the colony would obtain for ten days or a fortnight the great fair at montreal continued a picturesque bazaar it must have been this meeting of the two ends of civilization for trade has been in all ages a mighty magnet to draw the ends of the earth together when all the furs had been sold the coureurs de bois took some goods along with them to be used partly in trade on their own account at the western posts and partly as presents from the king to the western chieftains there is reason to suspect however that much of what the royal bounty provided for this latter purpose was diverted to private use there were annual fairs at three rivers for the indians of the st maurice region at sorel for those of the richelieu and at quebec and at tadoussac for the redskins of the lower st lawrence but montreal owing to its situation at the confluence of the st lawrence and ottawa trade routes was by far the greatest fur mart of all it has been mentioned that the colonial authorities tried to discourage trading at the western posts their aim was to bring the indian with his furs to the colonial settlement but this policy could not be fully carried out despite the most rigid prohibitions and the severest penalties some of the coureurs de bois would take goods and brandy to sell in the wilderness finding that this practice could not be exterminated the authorities decided to permit a limited amount of forest trading under strict regulation and to this end the king authorized the granting of twenty-five licenses each year these licenses permitted a trader to take three canoes with as much merchandise as they would hold as a rule the licenses were not issued directly to the traders themselves but were given to the religious institutions or to dependent widows of former royal officers these in turn sold them to the traders sometimes for a thousand livres or more the system of granting twenty-five annual licenses did not of itself throw the door wide open for trade at the western establishments but as time went on the plan was much abused by the granting of private licenses to the friends of the officials at quebec and god knows how many of these were issued as one writer of the time puts it traders often went moreover without any license at all and especially in the matter of carrying brandy into the forest they frequently set the official orders at defiance this brandy question was in fact the great troubler in israel it bulks large in every chronicle every memoir every relation and in almost every official dispatch during a period of more than fifty years it worried the king himself it set the officers of the church and state against each other and it provoked more friction throughout the western dominions of france than all other issues put together as to the ethics of the liquor traffic in new france there was never any serious disagreement even the secular authorities readily admitted that brandy did the indians no good and that it would be better to sell them blankets and kettles but that was not the point the traders believed that if the western indians could not secure brandy from the french they would get rum from the english the indian would be no better off in that case and the french would lose their hold on him into the bargain time and again they reiterated the argument that the prohibition of the brandy trade would make an end to trade to french influence and even to the missionary's own labors for if the indian went to the english for rum he would get into touch with heresy as well he would have protestant missionaries come to his village and the day of jesuit propaganda would be at an end this 
throughout the whole trading period was the stock argument of publicans and sinners the jesuit missionaries combated it with all their power yet they never fully convinced either the colonial or the home authorities louis the fourteenth urged by his confessor to take one stand and by his minister to take the other was sorely puzzled he wanted to do his duty as a most christian king yet he did not want to have on his hands a bankrupt colony bishop laval pleaded with colbert that brandy would spell the ruin of all religion in the new world but the subtle minister calmly retorted that the eau de vie had not yet overcome the ancient church in older lands to set his conscience right the king referred the whole question to the savants of the sorbonne and they like good churchmen promptly gave their opinion that to sell intoxicants to the heathen was a heinous sin but that counsel afforded the grand monarch scant guidance for it was not the relative sinfulness of the brandy trade that perplexed him the practical expediency of issuing a decree of prohibition was what lay upon his mind on that point colbert gave him sensible advice namely that a question of practical policy could be better settled by the colonists themselves than by cloistered scholars guided by this suggestion the king asked for a limited plebiscite the governor of new france was requested to call together the leading inhabitants of the colony and to obtain from each one his opinion in writing here was an inkling of colonial self-government and it is unfortunate that the king did not resort more often to the same method of solving the colony's problems on october twenty sixth sixteen seventy eight frontenac gathered the leading inhabitants in the chateau at quebec apart from the officials and military officers on the one hand and the clergy on the other most of the solid men of new france were there one after another their views were called for and written down most of those present expressed the opinion that the evils of the traffic had been exaggerated and that if the french should prohibit the sale of brandy to the savages they would soon lose their hold upon the western trade there were some dissenters among them a few who urged a more rigid regulation of the traffic one hard-headed seigneur the sieur d'ambourg raised the query whether the colony was really so dependent for its existence upon the fur trade as the others had assumed to be the case if there were less attention to trade he urged there would be more heed paid to agriculture and in the long run it would be better for the colony to ship wheat to france instead of furs let the western trade go to the english in exchange for their rum it would neither endure long nor profit them much this was sound sense but it did not carry great weight with dombourg's hearers the written testimony was put together and with comments by the governor was sent to france for the information of the king and his ministers apparently it has some effect for without altogether prohibiting the use of brandy in the western trade a royal decree of sixteen seventy nine forbade the coureurs de bois to carry it with them on their trips up the lakes the issue of this decree however made no perceptible change in the situation and brandy was taken to the western posts as before so far as one can determine from the actual figures of the trade however the quantity of intoxicants used by the french in the indian trade has been greatly exaggerated by the missionaries not more than fifty barrels barrique ever went to the western regions in the course of a year a barrel held about two hundred and fifty pints so that the total would be less than one pint per capita for the adult indians within the french sphere of influence that was a far smaller per capita consumption than frenchmen guzzled in a single day at a breton fair as la salle once pointed out the trouble was however that thousands of indians got no brandy at all while a relatively small number obtained too much of it what they got moreover was poor stuff most of it and well diluted with water the indian drank to get drunk and when brandy constituted the other end of the bargain he would give for it the very furs off his back but if the jesuits exaggerated the amount of brandy used in the trade they did not exaggerate its demoralizing effect upon both the indian and the trader they believed that brandy would wreck the indian's body and ruin his soul they were right it did both it made of every western post in the words of father carhai a den of brutality and violence of injustice and impiety of lewd and shameless conduct of contempt and insults no sinister motives need be sought to explain the bitterness with which the black robes cried out against 
the iniquities of a system which swindled the redskin out of his furs and debauched him into the bargain had the jesuits done otherwise than fight it from first to last they would have been false to the traditions of their church and their order they were when all is said and done the truest friends that the north american indian has ever had the effects of the fur trade upon both indians and french were far-reaching the trade changed the red man's order of life took him in a single generation from the stone to the iron age demolished his old notions of the world carried him on long journeys and made him a different man french brandy and english rum sapped his stamina and the grand libertinage of the traders calloused whatever moral sense he had his folklore his religion and his institutions made no progress after the trader had once entered his territories on the french the effects of tribal commerce were not so disastrous though pernicious enough the trade drew off into the wilderness the vigorous blood of the colony it cast its spell over new france from la chine to the saguenay men left their farms their wives and their families they mortgaged their property and they borrowed from their friends in order to join the annual hegira to the west yet very few of these traders accumulated fortunes it was not the trader but the merchant at montreal or quebec who got the lion's share of the profit and took none of the risks many of the coureurs de bois entered the trade with ample funds and emerged in poverty nicolas perrault and gray salon de lutte were conspicuous examples it was a highly speculative game at times large profits came easily and were spent recklessly the trade encouraged profligacy bravado and garishness it deadened the moral sense of the colony and even schooled men in trickery and peculation it was a corrupting influence in the official life of new france and even governors could not keep from soiling their hands in it but most unfortunate of all the colony was impelled to put its economic energies into what was at best an ephemeral and transitory source of national wealth and to neglect the solid foundations of agriculture and industry which in the long run would have profited its people much more End of chapter nine chapter ten of crusaders of new france by william bennett munro this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten agriculture industry and trade it was the royal desire that new france should some day become a powerful and prosperous agricultural colony providing the motherland with an acceptable addition to its food supply to this end large tracts of land were granted upon most liberal terms to incoming settlers and every effort was made to get these acres cultivated encouragement and coercion were alike given a trial settlers who did well were given official recognition sometimes even to the extent of rank in the noblesse on the other hand those who left their lands uncleared were repeatedly threatened with the revocation of their land titles and in some cases their holdings were actually taken away from the days of the earliest settlement down to the eve of the english conquest the officials of both the church and the state never ceased to use their best endeavors in the interests of colonial agriculture yet with all this official interest and encouragement agricultural development was slow much of the land on both the north and the south shores of the st lawrence was heavily timbered and the work of clearing proved tedious it was estimated that an industrious settler working by himself could clear not more than one superficial arpent in a whole season so slowly did the work make progress in fact that in seventeen twelve after fifty years of royal paternalism the cultivable area of new france amounted to only one hundred and fifty thousand arpents and at the close of the french dominion in seventeen sixty it was scarcely more than twice that figure in other words about five arpents for each head of population while industry and trade particularly the indian trade took the attention and interest of a considerable portion in the population of new france agriculture was from first to last the vocation of the great majority 
the census of 1695 showed more than 75 per cent of the people living on the farms of the colony and this ratio was almost exactly maintained nearly sixty years later when the census of 1754 was compiled this population was scattered along both banks of the st lawrence from a point well below quebec to the region surrounding montreal most of the farms fronted on the river so that every habitant had a few arpents of marshy land for hay a tract of cleared upland for ploughing and an area extending to the rear which might be turned into meadow or left uncleared to supply him with firewood wheat and maize were the great staples although large quantities of oats barley and peas were also grown the wheat was invariably spring sown and the yield averaged from eight to twelve hundred weights per arpent or from ten to fourteen bushels per acre most of the wheat was made into flour at the seigneurial mills and was consumed in the colony but shipments were also made with fair regularity to france to the west indies and for a time to louisbourg in seventeen thirty six the exports of wheat amounted to nearly one hundred thousand bushels and in the year following the banner harvest of seventeen forty one this total was nearly doubled the price which the habitant got for wheat at quebec ranged normally from two to four livres per hundredweight about thirty to sixty cents per bushel depending upon the harvests in the colony and the safety with which wheat could be shipped to france which again hinged upon the fact whether france and england were at peace or at war indian corn was not exported to any large extent but many cargoes of dried peas were sent abroad and occasionally there were small shipments of oats and beans there was also a considerable production of hemp flax and tobacco but not for export in any large quantity the tobacco grown in the colony was coarse and ill-flavoured it was smoked by both the habitant and the indian because it was cheap but brazilian tobacco was greatly preferred by those who could afford to buy it and large quantities of this were brought in the french government frowned upon tobacco growing in new france believing as colbert wrote to talon in sixteen seventy two that any such policy would be prejudicial to the interests of the french colonies in the tropical zones which were much better adapted to this branch of cultivation cattle raising made substantial progress and the king urged the sovereign council to prohibit the slaughter of cattle so that the herds might keep on growing but the stock was not of a high standard but undersized of mongrel breed and poorly cared for sheep raising despite the brisk demand for wool made slow headway most of the wool needed in the colony had to be brought from france and the demand was great because so much woolen clothing was required for winter use the keeping of poultry was of course another branch of husbandry the habitants were fond of horses even the poorest managed to keep two or three which was a wasteful policy as there was no work for the horses to do during nearly half the year fodder however was abundant and cost nothing as each habitant obtained from the flats along the river all that he could cut and carry away this marsh hay was not of superior quality but it at least served to carry the horses and stock through the winter the methods of agriculture were beyond question slovenly and crude catalonia the engineer whom the authorities commissioned to make an agricultural census of the colony ventured the opinion that if the fields of france were cultivated as the farms of canada were three-quarters of the french people would starve rotation of crops was practically unknown and fertilization of the land was rare although the habitant frequently burned the stubble before putting the plough to his fields from time to time a part of each farm was allowed to lie fallow but such fallow fields were left unploughed and soon grew so rank with weeds that the soil really got no rest at all all the ploughing was done in the spring and it was not very well done at that for the land was ploughed in ridges which left much waste between the furrows too often the seed became poor as a result of the habitant using seed from his own crops year after year until it became run out 
most of the cultivated land was high and dry and needed no artificial drainage even where the water lay on the land late in the spring however there was rarely an attempt as peter calm in his travels remarks to drain it off the habitant had patience in greater measure than industry and he was always ready to wait for nature to do his work everybody depended for his implements largely upon his own workmanship so that the tools of agriculture were of poor construction the cultivation of even a few arpents required a great deal of manual drudgery on the other hand the land of new france was fertile and every one could have plenty of it for the asking calm thought it quite as good as the average in the english colonies and far better than most arable land in his own scandinavia why then did french canadian agriculture despite the warm official encouragement given to it make such relatively meagre progress there are several reasons for its backwardness the long winters which developed in the habitant an inveterate disposition to idleness afford the clue to one of them a general aversion to unremitting manual toil was one of the colony's besetting sins notwithstanding the small per capita acreage accordingly there was a continual complaint that not enough labour could be had to work the farms women and children were pressed into service in the busy seasons yet the colony abounded in idle men and mendicancy at one time assumed such proportions as to require the enforcement of stringent penalties the authorities were partly to blame for the development of this trait for upon the slightest excuse they took the habitant from his daily routine and set him to help with warlike expeditions against the indians and the english or called him to build roads or to repair the fortifications and the lure of the fur trade which drew the most vigorous young men of the land off the farms into the forest was another obstacle to the growth of yeomanry moreover the curious and inconvenient shape of the farms most of them mere ribbons of land with a narrow frontage and disproportionate depth handicapped all efforts to cultivate the fields in an intelligent way finally there was the general poverty of the people with a large family to support for families of ten to fifteen children were not uncommon it was hard for the settler to make both ends meet from the annual yield of a few arpents however fertile the habitant therefore took the shortest cut to everything getting what he could out of his land in the quickest possible way with no reference to the ultimate improvement of the farm itself if he ever managed to get a little money he was likely to spend it at once and to become as impecunious as before such a propensity did not make for progress for poverty begets slovenliness in all ages and among all races of men if anything like the industry and intelligence that was bestowed upon agriculture in the english colonies had been applied to the st lawrence valley new france might have shipped far more wheat than beaver skins each year to europe but in this respect the colony never half realized the royal expectations on the other hand the attempt to make the land a rich grain-growing colony was far from being a flat failure it was supporting its own population and had a modest amount of grain each year for export to france or to the french west indies with peace it would soon have become a land of plenty for the traveller who passed along the great river from quebec to montreal in the late autumn might see as calm in his travels tells us he saw field upon field of waving grain extending from the shores inward as far as the eye could reach broken only here and there by tracts of meadow and woodland here was at least the nucleus of a golden west of colonial industry however not as much can be said as of agriculture down to about sixteen sixty three it had given scarcely a single token of existence the colony until that date manufactured nothing everything in the way of furnishings utensils apparel and ornament was brought in the company's ships from france and no one seemed to look upon this procedure as at all unusual on the coming of talon in sixteen sixty five however the idea of fostering home industries in the colony took active shape by persuasion and by promise of reward the colbert of new france interested the prominent citizens of quebec in modest industrial enterprises of every sort but the outcome soon belied the intendant's airy hopes 
it was easy enough to make a brave start in these things especially with the aid of an initial subsidy from the treasury but to keep the wheels of industry moving year after year without a subvention was an altogether different thing a colony numbering less than ten thousand souls did not furnish an adequate market for the products of varied industries and the high cost of transportation made it difficult to export manufactured wares to france or to the west indies with any hope of profit a change of tone moreover soon became noticeable in colbert's dispatches with reference to industrial development in sixteen sixty five when giving his first instructions to talon the minister had dilated upon his desire that canada should become self-sustaining in the matter of clothing shoes and the simpler house furnishings but within a couple of years colbert's mind seems to have taken a different shift and we find him advising talon that after all it might be better if the people of new france would devote their energies to agriculture and thus to raise enough grain wherewith to buy manufactured wares from france so for one reason or another the infant industries languished and after talon was gone they gradually dropped out of existence another of talon's ventures was to send prospectors in search of minerals the use of malleable copper by the indians had been noted by the french for many years and various rumours concerning the source of supply had filtered through to quebec some of talon's agents including jean perret went as far as the upper lakes returning with samples of copper ore but the distance from quebec was too great for profitable transportation and although pere dablon in sixteen seventy sent down an accurate description of the great masses of ore in the lake superior region many generations were to pass before any serious attempt could be made to develop this source of wealth nearer at hand some titaniferous iron ore was discovered at bailly st paul below quebec but it was not utilized although on being tested it was found to be good in quality then the intendant sent agents to verify reports as to rich coal deposits in ile royale cape breton and they returned with glowing accounts which subsequent industrial history has entirely justified shipments of this coal were brought to quebec for consumption a little later the intendant reported to colbert that a vein of coal had been actually uncovered at the foot of the great rock which frowns upon the lower town at quebec adding that the vein could not be followed for fear of toppling over the chateau which stood above no one has ever since found any trace of talon's coal deposit and the geologists of to-day are quite certain that the intendant had more imagination than accuracy of statement or even of elementary mineralogical knowledge above the settlement at three rivers some excellent deposits of bog iron ore were found in sixteen sixty eight but it was not until five decades later that the first forges were established there these were successfully operated throughout the remainder of the old regime and much of the colony's iron came from them to supply the blacksmiths from time to time rumours of other mineral discoveries came to the ears of the people a find of lead was reported from the gaspe peninsula but an investigation proved it to be a hoax copper was actually found in a dozen places within the settled ranges of the colony but not in paying quantities every one was always on the qui vive for a vein of gold or silver but no part of new france ever gave the slightest hint of an el dorado prospecting engaged the energies of many colonists in every generation but most of those who thus spent their years at it got nothing but a princely dividend of chagrin mention should also be made of the brewing industry which talon set upon its feet during his brief intendancy but which like all the rest of his schemes did not long survive his departure in establishing a brewery at quebec the paternal intendant had two ends in mind first to reduce the large consumption of eau de vie by providing a cheaper and more wholesome substitute and second to furnish the farmers of the colony with a profitable home market for their grain in seventeen seventy one talon reported to the french authorities that the quebec brewery was capable of turning out four thousand hogsheads of beer per annum and thus of creating a demand for many thousand bushels of malt 
hops were also needed and were expensive when brought from france so that the people were encouraged to grow hop vines in the colony but even with grain and hops at hand the brewing industry did not thrive and before many years talon's enterprise closed its doors the building was finally remodelled and became the headquarters of the later intendants flour-making and lumbering were the two industries which made most consistent progress in the colony flour-mills were established both in and near quebec at an early date and in course of time there were scores of them scattered throughout the colony most of them built and operated as banal mills by the seigneurs the majority were windmills after the dutch fashion but some were water-driven on the whole they were not very efficient and turned out flour of such indifferent grade that the bakers of quebec complained loudly on more than one occasion in response to a request from the intendant the king sent out some fanning mills which were distributed to various seigneuries but even this benefaction did not seem to make any great improvement in the quality of the product yet in some years the colony had flour of sufficiently good quality for export and sent small cargoes both to france and to the french west indies the sawing of lumber was carried on in various parts of the colony particularly at malbaye and at baye st paul beam timbers planks staves and shingles were made in large quantities both for use in the colony and for export to france where the timbers and planks were in demand at the royal shipyards wherever lands were granted by the crown a provision was inserted in the title deed reserving all oak timber and all pine of various species suitable for mastings though such timber was not to be cut without official permission the people did not always respect this reservation yet the quantity of timber shipped to france was very large and next to furs it formed the leading item in the cargoes of outgoing ships for staves there was a good market at quebec where barrels were being made for the packing of salted fish and eels the various handicrafts or small industries such as blacksmithing cabinet making pottery brick making were regulated quite as strictly in canada as in france the artisans of the towns were organized into jurés or guilds and elected a master for each trade these masters were responsible to the civil authorities for the proper quality of the work done and for the observance of all the regulations which were promulgated by the intendant or the council from time to time this relative proficiency in home industry accounts in part for the tardy progress of the colony in the matter of large industrial establishments but there were other handicaps for one thing the paris authorities were not anxious to see the colony become industrially self-sustaining colbert in his earliest instructions to talon wrote as though this were the royal policy but no other minister ever hinted at such a desire rather it was thought best that the colony should confine itself to the production of raw materials leaving it to france to supply manufactured wares in return the mercantilist doctrine that a colony existed for the benefit of the mother country was gospel at fontainebleau even montcalm a man of liberal inclinations expressed this idea with undiminished vigour in a day when its evil results must have been apparent to the naked eye let us beware he wrote how we allow the establishment of industries in canada or she will become proud and mutinous like the english colonies so long as france is a nursery to canada let not the canadians be allowed to trade but kept to their laborious life and military services the exclusion of the huguenots from canada was another industrial misfortune a few huguenot artisans came to quebec from rochelle at an early date and had they been welcomed more would soon have followed but they were promptly deported from an economic standpoint this was an unfortunate policy the huguenots were resourceful workmen skilled in many trades they would have supplied the colony with a vigorous and enterprising stock but the interests of orthodoxy and religion were paramount with the authorities and they kept from canada the one class of settlers which most desired to come many of those same huguenots went to england and every student of economic history knows how greatly they contributed to the upbuilding of england's later supremacy in the textile and related industries 
if we turn to the field of commerce the spirit of restriction appears as prominently as in the domain of industry the company of one hundred associates during its thirty years of control allowed no one to proceed to quebec except on its own vessels and nothing could be imported except through its storehouses its successor the company of the west indies which dominated colonial commerce from sixteen sixty four to sixteen sixty nine was not a whit more liberal even under the system of royal government the consistent keynotes of commercial policy were regulation paternalism and monopoly this is in no sense surprising spain had first given to the world this policy of commercial constraint and the great enrichment of the spanish monarchy was everywhere held to be its outcome france by reason of her similar political and administrative system found it easy to drift into the wake of the spanish example the official classes in england and holland would fain have had these countries do likewise but private initiative and enterprise proved too strong in the end as for new france there were spells during which the grip of the trading monopolies relaxed but these lucid intervals were never very long when the company of the west indies became bankrupt in sixteen sixty nine the trade between new france and old was ostensibly thrown open to the traders of both countries and for the moment this freedom gave colbert and his canadian apostle talon an opportunity to carry out their ideas of commercial upbuilding the great minister had as his ideal the creation of a huge fleet of merchant vessels built and operated by frenchmen which would ply to all quarters of the globe bringing raw products to france and taking manufactured wares in return it was under the inspiration of this ideal that talon built at quebec a small vessel and having freighted it with lumber fish corn and dried peas sent it off to the french west indies after taking on board a cargo of sugar the vessel was then to proceed to france and exchanging the sugar for goods which were needed in the regions of the st lawrence it was to return to quebec the intendant's plans for this triangular trade were well conceived and in a general way they aimed at just what the english colonies along the atlantic seaboard were beginning to do at the time the keels of other ships were being laid at quebec and the officials were dreaming of great maritime achievements but as usual the enterprise never got beyond the sailing of the first vessel for its voyage did not yield a profit the ostensible throwing open of the colonial trade moreover did not actually change to any great extent the old system of paternalism and monopoly commercial companies no longer controlled the channels of transportation it is true but the royal government was not minded to let everything take its own course so the trade was taxed for the benefit of the royal treasury and the privilege of collecting the taxes according to the custom of the old regime was farmed out all the commerce of the colony imports and exports had to pass through the hands of these farmers of the revenue who levied ten per cent on all goods coming and kept for the royal treasury one quarter of the price fixed for all skins exported traders as a rule were not permitted to ship their furs directly to france they turned them in to farmers of the revenue at quebec where they received the price as fixed by ordinance less one quarter this price they usually took in bills of exchange on paris which they handed over to the colonial merchants in payment for goods and which the merchants in turn sent home to france to pay for new stocks nor were the authorities content with the mere fixing of prices by ordinance they also set the rate of profit which traders should have upon all imported wares brought into the colony this rate of profit was fixed at sixty-five per cent but the traders had no compunction in going above it whenever they saw an opportunity which was not likely to be discovered as far as the forest trade was concerned the regulation was of course absurd every year about the beginning of may the first ships left france for the st lawrence with general cargoes consisting of goods for the colonists themselves and for the indians as well as large quantities of brandy when they arrived at quebec the vessels were met by the merchants of the town and by those who had come from three rivers and montreal for a fortnight lively trading took place 
then the goods which had been bought by the merchants of montreal and three rivers were loaded upon small barks and brought to these towns to be in readiness for the annual fairs when the coureurs de bois and their indians came down to trade in the late summer as for the vessels which had come from france these were either loaded with timber or furs and set off directly home again or else they departed light to cape breton and took cargoes of coal for the french west indies where the refining of sugar occasioned a demand for fuel the last ships left in november and for seven months the colony was cut off from europe trade at quebec while technically open to any one who would pay the duties and observe the regulations as to rates of profit was actually in the hands of a few merchants who had large warehouses and who took the greater part of what the ships brought in these men were in turn affiliated more or less closely with the great trading houses which sent goods from rouen or rochelle so that the monopoly was nearly as ironclad as when commercial companies were in control when an outsider broke into the charmed circle as happened occasionally there was usually some way of hustling him out again by means either fair or foul the monopolists made large profits and many of them after they had accumulated a fortune went home to france i have known twenty of these peddlers quoth la Hontan, that had not above a thousand crowns stock when i arrived at quebec in the year sixteen eighty three and when i left that place had got to the tune of twelve thousand crowns glancing over the whole course of agriculture industry and commerce in new france from the time when champlain built his little post at the foot of cape diamond until the day when the fleur-de-lis fluttered down from the heights above the historian finds that there is one word which sums up the chief cause of the colony's economic weakness that word is paternalism the administration tried to take the place of providence it was as omnipresent and its ways were as inscrutable like as a father chasteneth his children so the king and his officials felt it their duty to chasten every show of private initiative which did not direct itself along the grooves that they had marked out for the colony to follow by trying to order everything they eventually succeeded in ordering nothing aright end of chapter ten chapter eleven of crusaders of new france by william bennett monroe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven how the people lived in new france there were no privileged orders this indeed was the most marked difference between the social organization of the home land and that of the colony there were social distinctions in canada to be sure but the boundaries between different elements of the population were not rigid there were no privileges based upon the laws of the land and no impenetrable barrier separated one class from another men could rise by their own efforts or come down through their own defaults their places in the community were not determined for them by the accident of birth as was the case in the older land some of the most successful figures in the public and business affairs of new france some of the social leaders some of those who attained the highest rank in the noblesse came of relatively humble parentage in france of the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries the chief officials of state the seigneurs the higher ecclesiastics even the officers of the army and the marine were always drawn from the nobility in the colony this was very far from being the case some colonial officials and a few of the seigneurs were among the numerous noblesse of france before they came and they of course retained their social rank in the new environment others were raised to this rank by the king usually for distinguished services in the colony and on the recommendation of the governor or the intendant but even if taken altogether these men constituted a very small proportion of the people in new france even among the seigneurs the great majority of these landed gentlemen came from the ranks of the people and not one in ten was a member of the noblesse 
there was therefore a social solidarity a spirit of fraternity and a feeling of universal comradeship among them which was altogether lacking at home the pivot of social life in new france was the settlement at quebec this was the colonial capital the seat of the governor and of the council the only town in the colony large enough to have all the trappings and tinsel of a well-rounded social set here too came some of the seigneurs to spend the winter months the royal officials the officers of the garrison the leading merchants the judges the notaries and a few other professional men these with their families made up an elite which managed to echo even if somewhat faintly the pomp and glamour of versailles quebec from all accounts was lively in the long winters its people who were shut off from all intercourse with europe for many months at a time soon learned the art of providing for their own recreation and amusement the knight-errant la Hontan speaks enthusiastically of the events in the life of this miniature society of the dinners and dances the salon and receptions the intrigues rivalries and flirtations all of which were well suited to his bohemian tastes but the clergy frowned upon this levity of which they believed there was far too much on one or two occasions they even laid a rigorous and restraining hand upon activities of which they disapproved notably when the young officers of the quebec garrison undertook an amateur performance of moliere's tartuffe in sixteen ninety four at montreal and three rivers the two smaller towns of the colony the social circle was more contracted and correspondingly less brilliant the capital indeed had no rival only a small part of the population however lived in the towns at the beginning of the eighteenth century the census seventeen o six showed a total of sixteen thousand four hundred and seventeen of whom less than three thousand were in the three chief settlements the others were scattered along both banks of the st lawrence but chiefly on the northern shore with the houses grouped into cuts or little villages which almost touched elbows along the banks of the stream in each of these hamlets the manor-house or home of the seigneur although not a mansion by any means was the focus of social life sometimes built of timber but more often of stone with dimensions rarely exceeding twenty feet by forty it was not much more pretentious than the homes of the more prosperous and thrifty among the seigneur's dependents its three or four spacious rooms were however more comfortably equipped with furniture which in many cases had been brought from france socially the seigneur and his family did not stand apart from his neighbours all went to the same church took part in the same amusements upon days of festival and not infrequently worked together at the common task of clearing the lands sons and daughters of the seigneurs often intermarried with those of habitants in the seigneury or of traders in the towns there was no social impasse such as existed in france among the various elements in a community as for the habitants the people who cleared and cultivated the lands of the seigneuries they worked and lived and dressed as pioneers are wont to do their homes were commonly built of felled timber or of rough-hewn stone solid low stocky buildings usually about twenty by forty feet or thereabouts in size with a single doorway and very few windows the roofs were steep pitched with a dormer window or two thrust out on either side the eaves projecting well over the walls in such manner as to give the structures a half bungalow appearance with almost religious punctuality the habitants whitewashed the outside of their walls every spring so that from the river the country houses looked trim and neat at all seasons between the river and the uplands ran the roadway close to which the habitants set their conspicuous dwellings with only in 
rare cases a grass plot or shade tree at the door in winter they bore the full blast of the winds that drove across the expanse a frozen stream in front of them in summer the hot sun blazed relentlessly upon the low roofs as each house stood but a few rods from its neighbour on either side the colony thus took on the appearance of one long straggling village street the habitant liked to be near his fellows partly for his own safety against marauding redskins but chiefly because the colony was at best a lonely place in the long cold season when there was little for any one to do behind each house was a small addition used as a storeroom not far away were the barn and the stable built always of untrimmed logs the intervening chinks securely filled with clay or mortar there was also a root-house half sunk in the ground or burrowed into the slope of a hill where the habitant kept his potatoes and vegetables secure from the frost through the winter most of the habitants likewise had their own bake ovens set a convenient distance behind the house and rising four or five feet from the ground these they built roughly of boulders and plastered with clay with an abundance of wood from the virgin forests they would build a roaring fire in these ovens and finish the whole week's baking at one time the habitant would often enclose a small plot of ground surrounding the house and outbuildings with a fence of piled stones or split rails and in one corner he would plant his kitchen garden within the dwelling-house there were usually two and never more than three rooms on the ground floor the doorway opened into the great room of the house parlour dining-room and kitchen combined a living-room it surely was in the better houses however this room was divided with the kitchen partitioned off from the rest most of the furnishings were the products of the colony and chiefly of the family's own workmanship the floor was of hewn timber rubbed and scrubbed to smoothness a woollen rug or several of them always of vivid hues covered the greater part of it there were the family dinner-table of hewn pine chairs made of pine saplings with seats of rushes or woven underbark and often in the corner a couch that would serve as an extra bed at night pictures of saints hung on the walls sharing the space with a crucifix but often having for ominous company the habitant's flintlock and his powder horn hanging from the beams at one end of the room was the fireplace and hearth the sole means of heating the place and usually the only means of cooking as well around it hung the array of pots and pans almost the only things in the house which the habitant and his family were not able to make for themselves the lack of colonial industries had the advantage of throwing each home upon its own resources and the people developed great versatility in the cruder arts of craftsmanship upstairs and reached by a ladder was a loft or attic running the full area of the house but so low that one could touch the rafters everywhere here the children often a dozen or more of them were stowed away at night on mattresses of straw or feathers laid along the floor as the windows were securely fastened even in the coldest weather this attic was warm if not altogether hygienic the love of fresh air in his dwelling was not among the habitants virtues every one went to bed shortly after darkness fell upon the land and all rose with the sun even visits and festivities were not at that time prolonged into the night as they are nowadays therein however new france did not differ from other lands in the seventeenth century most of the world went to bed at nightfall because there was nothing else to do and no easy or inexpensive artificial light candles were in use to be sure but a great many more of them were burned on the altars of the churches than in the homes of the people for his reading the habitant depended upon the priest and for his writing upon the notary clothing was almost wholly made at home it was warm and durable as well as somewhat distinctive and picturesque every parish had spinning wheels and hand looms in some of its homes on which the women turned out the heavy druggets or a tuft du paillis from which most of the men's clothing was made 
a great fabric it was this homespun with nothing but wool in it not attractive in pattern but able to stand no end of wear it was fashioned for the habitant's use into roomy trousers and a long frock coat reaching to the knees which he tied around his waist with a belt of leather or of knitted yarn the women also used this a tiff for skirts but their waists and summer dresses were of calico homemade as well as for the children most of them ran about in the summer months wearing next to nothing at all a single garment without sleeves and reaching to the knees was all that covered their nakedness for all ages and for both sexes there were furs in plenty for winter use beaver skins were cheap in some years about as cheap as cloth when properly treated they were soft and pliable and easily made into clothes caps and mittens most of the footwear was made at home usually from deer hides in winter every one wore the butt sauvage or oiled moccasins laced up halfway or more to the knees they were proof against cold and were serviceable for use with snowshoes between them and his feet the habitant wore two or more pairs of heavy woollen socks made from coarse homespun yarn in summer the women and children of the rural communities usually went barefoot so that the soles of their feet grew as tough as pigskin the men sometimes did likewise but more frequently they wore in the fields or in the forest clogs made of cowhide on the weekdays of summer every one wore a straw hat which the women of the household spent part of each winter in plaiting in cold weather the knitted toque made in vivid colours was the great favourite it was warm and picturesque each section of the colony had its own colour the habitants in the vicinity of quebec wore blue toques while those around montreal preferred red the apparel of the people was thus in general adapted to the country and it had a distinctiveness that has not yet altogether passed away on sundays and on the numerous days of festival however the habitant and his family brought out their best to mass the men wore clothes of better texture and high beaver hats the women appeared in their brighter plumage of dresses with ribbons and laces imported from france such finery was brought over in so large a quantity that more than one memoir to the home government censured the spirit of extravagance of which this was one outward manifestation in the towns the officials and the well-to-do merchants dressed elaborately on all occasions of ceremony with scarlet cloaks and perukes buckled slippers and silk stockings in early canada there was no austerity of garb such as we find in puritan new england new france on a jour de fete was a blaze of colour as for his daily fare the habitant was never badly off even in the years when harvests were poor he had food that was more nourishing and more abundant than the french peasant had at home bread was made from both wheat and rye flour the product of the seigneurial mills corn cakes were baked in indian fashion from ground maize fat salted pork was a staple during the winter and nearly every habitant laid away each autumn a smoked supply of eels from the river game of all sorts he could get with little trouble at any time wild ducks and geese partridges for there were in those days no game laws to protect them in the early winter likewise it was indeed a luckless habitant who could not also get a caribou or two for his larder following the indian custom the venison was smoked and hung on the kitchen beams where it kept for months until needed salted or smoked fish had also to be provided for family use since the usages of the church required that meat should not be used upon numerous fast days vegetables of many varieties were grown in new france where the warm sandy virgin soil of the st lawrence region was splendidly suited for this branch of husbandry peas were the great standby and in the old days whole families were reared upon soup au pois which was and may even still be said to be the national dish of the french canadians beans cucumbers melons and a dozen other products were also grown in the family gardens there were potatoes which the habitant called patatas and not pommes de terre but they were almost 
a rarity until the closing days of the old regime wild fruits chiefly raspberries blueberries and wild grapes grew in abundance among the foothills and were gathered in great quantities every summer there was not much orchard fruit although some seedling trees were brought from france and had managed to become acclimated on the whole even in the humbler homes there was no need for any one to go hungry the daily fare of the people was not of great variety but it was nourishing and there was plenty of it save in rare instances more than one visitor to the colony was impressed by the rude comfort in which the people lived even though they made no pretence of being well-to-do in new france wrote charlevoix poverty is hidden behind an air of comfort while the gossipy la Hontan was of the opinion that the boors of these seigneuries live with greater comfort than an infinity of the gentlemen in france occasionally when the men were taken from the fields to serve in the defence of the colony against the english attacks the harvests were small and the people had to spend the ensuing winter on short rations yet as the authorities assured the king they were robust vigorous and able in time of need to live on little as for beverages the habitant was inordinately fond of sour milk tea was scarce and costly brandy was imported in huge quantities and not all this eau de vie as some writers imagine went into the indian trade the people themselves consumed most of it every parish in the colony had its grog shop in seventeen twenty five the king ordered that no parish should have more than two quebec had a dozen or more and complaint was made that the people flocked to these resorts early in the morning thus rendering themselves unfit for work during most of the day and soon ruining their health into the bargain there is no doubt that the people of new france were fond of the flagon for not only the priests but the civil authorities complained of this failing idleness due to the numerous holidays and to the long winters combined with the tradition of hospitality to encourage this taste the habitants were fond of visiting one another and hospitality demanded on every such occasion the proffer of something to drink on the other hand the scenes of debauchery which a few chroniclers have described were not typical of the colony the year round when the ships came in with their cargoes there was a great indulgence in feasting and drink and the excesses at this time were sure to impress the casual visitor but when the fleet had weighed anchor and departed for france there was a quick return to the former quietness and to a reasonable measure of sobriety tobacco was used freely every farmer wrote calm plants a quantity of tobacco near his house because it is universally smoked boys of twelve years of age often run about with the pipe in their mouths the women were smokers too but more commonly they used tobacco in the form of snuff in those days as in our own this french canadian tobacco was strong stuff cured in the sun till the leaves were black and when smoked emitting an odour that scented the whole parish the art of smoking a pipe was one of several profitless habits which the frenchman lost little time in acquiring from his indian friends this convivial temperament of the inhabitants of new france has been noted by more than one contemporary the people did not spend all their energies and time at hard labour from october when the crops were in until may when the season of seed time came again there was indeed little hard work for them to do aside from the cutting of firewood and the few household chores the day was free and the habitants therefore spent it in driving about and visiting neighbours drinking and smoking dancing and playing cards winter accordingly was the great social season in the country as well as in the town the chief festivities occurred at michaelmas christmas easter and may day of these the first and the last were closely connected with the seigneurial system on michaelmas the habitant came to pay the annual rental for his lands on may day he rendered the maypole homage which has been already described christmas and easter were the great festivals of the church and as such were celebrated with religious fervour and solemnity in addition minor festivals chiefly religious in character were numerous so much so that their frequency even in the months of cultivation was the subject of complaint by the civil authorities who felt that these holidays took altogether too much time from labour sunday was a day not only of worship but of recreation clad in his best raiment every one went to mass whatever the distance or the weather 
the parish church indeed was the emblem of village solidarity for it gathered within its walls each sunday morning all sexes and ages and ranks the habitant did not separate his religion from his work or his amusements the outward manifestations of his faith were not to his mind things of another world the church and its priests were the centre and soul of his little community the whole countryside gathered about the church doors after the service while the capitaine de la cote the local representative of the intendant read the decrees that had been sent to him from the seats of the mighty at the chateau de st louis that duty over there was a garrulous interchange of local gossip of such news as had dribbled through from france the crowd then melted away in groups to spend the rest of the day in games or dancing or in friendly visits of one family with another especially popular among the young people of each parish were the corvee recreative or bees as we call them nowadays in our rural communities there were the epouchelette or corn husking the brayage or flax beating and others of the same sort the harvest home or gross gerbe celebrated when the last load had been brought in from the fields and the ignole or welcoming of the new year were all occasions of goodwill noise and revelry dancing was by all odds the most popular pastime and every parish had its fiddler who was quite as indispensable a factor in the life of the village as either the smith or the notary every wedding was the occasion for terpsichorean festivities which lasted all day long the habitant liked to sing especially when working with others in the woods or when on the march the voyageurs relieved the tedium of their long journeys by breaking into song at intervals but the popular repertoire was limited to a few folk-songs most of them songs of old france they were easy to learn simple to sing but sprightly and melodious some of them have remained on the lips and in the hearts of the french canadian race for over two hundred years those who do not know that claire fontaine and ma boule roland have never known french canada the forêtier of to-day still goes to the woods chanting the malbrouc sans va ton guerre which his ancestors carolled in the days of blenheim and malplaquet when the habitants sang moreover it was in no pianissimo tones he was lusty and cheerful about giving vent to his buoyant spirits and his descendant of to-day has not lost that propensity the folklore of the old dominion unlike the folk music was extensive some of it came with the colonists from their norman firesides but more perhaps was the outcome of a superstitious popular imagination working in the new and strange environment of the wilderness the habitant had a profound belief in the supernatural and was prone to associate miraculous handiwork with every unusual event he peopled the earth and the air the woods and the rivulets with spirits of diverse forms and varied motives the red man's abounding superstition likewise had some influence upon the habitant's high-strung temperament at any rate new france was full of legends and weird tales every island every cove in the river had one or more associated with it most of these legends had some moral lessons attached to them they were tales of disaster which came from disobeying the teachings of the church or of miraculous escape from death or perdition due to the supernatural rewarding of righteousness taken together they make up a wholesome and vigorous body of folklore reflecting both the mystic temper of the colony and the religious fervour of its common life a distinguished son of french canada has with great industry gathered these legends together a service for which posterity will be grateful various chroniclers have left as pen portraitures of the habitant as they saw him in the olden days charlevoix la Hontan, hocar and peter calm men of widely different tastes and aptitudes all bear testimony to his vigour stamina and native-born vivacity he was courteous and polite always yet there was no flavour of servility in this most benign trait of character it was bred in his bone and was fostered by the teachings of his church along with this went a bonhomie 
and a light-heartedness a touch of personal vanity with a liking for display and ostentation which unhappily did not make for thrift the habitant enjoys what he has got writes charles Lecoubar, and often makes a display of what he has not got he was also fond of honours even minor ones and plumed himself on the slightest recognition from official circles habitants who by years of hard labour had saved enough to buy some uncleared seigneury strutted about with the airs of genuine aristocrats while their wives in the words of governor de nonville essayed to play the fine lady more than one intendant was amused by this broad streak of vanity in the colonial character every one here wrote murrell begins by calling himself an esquire and ends by thinking himself a nobleman yet despite this attempt to keep up appearances the people were poor clearing the land was a slow process and the cultivable area available for the support of each household was small early marriages were the rule and families of a dozen or more children had to be supported from the produce of a few arpents to maintain such a family as this every one had to work hard in the growing season and even the women went to the fields in the harvest time one serious shortcoming of the habitant was his lack of steadfastness in labour there was a roving strain in his norman blood he could not stay long at any one job there was a restlessness in his temperament which would not down he would leave his fields unploughed in order to go hunting or to turn a few sous in some small trading adventure unstable as water he did not excel in tasks that required patience but he could do a great many things after a fashion and some that could be done quickly he did surprisingly well one racial characteristic which drew comment from observers of the day was the litigious disposition of the people the habitant would have made lawsuits his chief diversion had he been permitted to do so if this propensity be not curbed wrote the intendant rodeau there will soon be more lawsuits in this country than there are persons the people were not quarrelsome in the ordinary sense but they were very jealous each one of his private rights and the opportunities for litigation over such matters seemed to provide themselves without end lands were given to settlers without accurate description of their boundaries farms were unfenced and cattle wandered into neighbouring fields the notaries themselves were almost illiterate and as a result scarcely a legal document in the colony was properly drawn nobody lacked pretext for controversy idleness during the winter was also a contributing factor but the church and the civil authorities frowned upon this habit of rushing to court with every trivial complaint cure and seigneur did what they could to have such difficulties settled amicably at home and in a considerable measure they succeeded new france was born and nurtured in an atmosphere of religious devotion to the habitant the church was everything his school his counsellor his almsgiver his newspaper his philosopher of things present and of things to come to him it was the source of all knowledge experience and inspiration and to it he never faltered in ungrudging loyalty the church made the colony a spiritual unit and kept it so undefiled by any taint of heresy it furnished the one strong well-disciplined organization that new france possessed and its missionaries blazed the way for both yeomen and trader wherever they went many traits of the race have been carried on to the present day without substantial change the habitant of the old dominion was a voluble talker a teller of great stories about his own feats of skill and endurance his hair-raising escapes or his astounding prowess with musket and fishing line stories grew in terms of prodigious achievement as they passed from tongue to tongue and the scant regard for anything approaching the truth in these matters became a national eccentricity the habitant was boastful in all that concerned himself or his race never did a people feel more firmly assured that it was the salt of the earth he was proud of his ancestry and proud of his allegiance and so are his descendants of to-day even though their allegiance has changed to speak of the habitants of new france as downtrodden or oppressed dispirited or despairing like the peasantry of the old land in the days before the great revolution as some historians have done is to speak untruthfully these people were neither serfs nor peons the habitant as charlevoix puts it 
breathed from his birth the air of liberty he had his rights and he maintained them shut off from the rest of the world knowing only what the church and civil government allowed him to know he became provincial in his horizon and conservative in his habits of mind the paternal policy of the authorities sapped his initiative and left him little scope for personal enterprise so that he passed for being a dull fellow yet the annals of forest trade and indian diplomacy proved that the new world possessed no sharper wits than his beneath a somewhat ungainly exterior the yeoman and the trader of new france concealed qualities of cunning tact and quick judgment to a surprising degree these various types in the population of new france officials missionaries seigneurs voyageurs habitants were all the scions of a proud race admirably fitted to form the rank and file in a great crusade it was not their fault that france failed to dominate the western hemisphere end of chapter eleven end of crusaders of new france by william bennett munroe